Thank you. Good, good. Whatever time of day you are in whatever part of the world you are. I'm uh, uh, webcasting to you from beautiful uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm just finishing a weekend with my son and new daughter-in-law who just got married yesterday. So I am outrageously happy. So uh, hopefully some of that will communicate my enthusiasm about talking about Arliss. I put a poll in just to uh, know about uh, how many folks know about Arliss ahead of this presentation. And um, I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end. And I'm going to go on and start the pitch. So ARLIS is an acronym for a rocket launch for international student satellites. And it's frankly the oldest CANSAT or CubeSat launch in the world now going on. We started in 1999 and we've done it annually. It is 22 years of rockets, robots, and STEM. And it is the ancestral uh, point. And I hope to share some of the things that we've learned from it and the projects that we've worked on to illuminate um, more of what the work you guys want to do. Uh, if you heard my pitch on 3D printing, so you've already heard who I am, but I'll go through it again for those of you that are new. Um, I wanted to be an astronaut, but when I grew up in the 50s and 60s, uh, the only people who could be astronauts were fighter pilots. So that wasn't going to be necessarily my future. So I needed to think about my robots to explore for me. My career arc is as a physicist and as a computer scientist then as a Silicon Valley startup guy, mostly in the role of CEO and CTO. My uh, wheelhouse is as a wireless networking expert, and I can claim at least partial parentage of Wi-Fi, cable modems, uh, computer security, and the internet. I've been doing 30 years in amateur rocketry. I'm a ham, TRA level three, a TAP for 20 years, sat on various boards in the, in the uh, amateur rocketry, held amateur altitude records. My team, uh, Arliss Extreme, uh, we, in 2012, we changed the bar to go above 100,000 feet on commercial motors, fully published and fully documented with real GPS data. Um, I put my own PicoSat in orbit to go test communication systems. And I've been mentoring adults and students for about 20 years, using rocketry as a, as a hook to be excited about rockets and robots and satellites. So I want to talk to you about Arliss today and how it began. It was motivated by challenging to develop engineering training for space as long development cycles, a long queue for time to orbit, though that queue is decreasing. Um, most engineers end up building payloads rather than rockets. And so, well, except we're seeing a, a provision of new launcher companies right now, but few of those are gonna end up succeeding just by the nature of startups. So Arliss chose to focus training on payloads and not just on rockets. And it created a couple of new standards. Uh, CubeSats and CanSats came out of Arliss in the early days. And now we're seeing a new standard called Pocket Cubes, which are one eighth the size of a CubeSat at five centimeter. And this reflects the fact that even today, cost for a satellite is highly coupled to mass lighter is cheaper. And I can put up a 1U, 1P CubeSat, pardon me, 1P pocket cube for about $25,000. And that's a lot less than any, any other format. And that LEO is a relatively benign space place. Commercial electronics work pretty well for reasonable amounts of time. And so we can practice for space closer to ground. And so Arliss in his 20 years began as the original CANSAT program in 1999. I give you a link there to uh, testimonial evidence by the guys that were there. I came in on uh, 2000, so I wasn't at the original kickoff meetings. But the original guy we owe this to is really Bob Twiggs, who is now retired from Stanford, and uh, Sinichi Nakasuka of Tokyo University, and also of JAXA, and their colleagues at other universities that uh, partnered with the Aeropack Rocket Club of Northern California, then led by Pius Morizumi and Tom Rouse. And it created a unique system of amateurs to provide high reliability rocket flights. And our core rocket in Arliss M looks a lot like the prototype of all the 10K rockets that uh, many of our students are flying. 
and the students would provide the payloads, just like students would buy a ride, our payloads buy a ride on a commercial rocket launcher. And that partnership between payload and ride uh, became the foundation. Today, it's hosted, it's an annual event every September, hosted by Aeropac and organized jointly with UNICEF Global, the Worldwide University Space Engineering Consortium. And Arlis is both a TRA activity and a NAR section. We have many, many, many universities from around the world. We've flown about 700 plus missions uh, with only three failures to deliver payload, which is a, a respectable 99.8% deployment success rate. And thousands of students have passed through the program. And many countries, their first satellites that go into orbit are constructed by alumni of the Arlis program. So one example I'm going to take is Yuichi Suda. He's now a professor of uh, uh, Institute of Space and Astronomical Science at Jackson. And he was there in 1999 as a student flying a first generation CANSAT, flew a CubeSat first generation, flew the first deep space solar sail as the deputy project manager, and was the lead project manager for Hayabusa 2, the asteroid return mission. So the, the disciplines of learning how to build and compete building great payloads uh, is, is really kind of a great, and uh, Arlis is a very competitive system. So there's 20 years of doing Arlis stuff, and I'm going to try to review them all here. The classic we call Arlis Classic. We fly CANSATs, which today the major payload is autonomous robots. Uh, the key mission on these autonomous robots is we call the comeback competition, in which we give the robot uh, a set of GPS coordinates on the Black Rock Playa, and the payload that, when deployed at Apogee, roughly about uh, 10,000 feet, uh, find its way back to those GPS coordinates either by landing and crawling, by gliding, or by flying as a quadcopter or something that we haven't even thought about. Uh, all that matters is the closest to the target goal. Um, another project we've done along the way is Virtual Classroom, which has now uh, been retired, but was the real first project to use satellite internet to deliver our list to the entire internet, since we, have a, we had an international collection of uh, students. <clears throat> we always wondered uh, in the early days on our rockets, what was the experience of our payloads? Because you see, if you're flowing a commercial payload, there's generally a set of specs that payloads must uh, conform to in terms of shock, vibration, temperature. So we decided to instrument our deployment to measure the experience, and we'll have data about that. Uh, we then decided we need to go higher and bigger. So we built Arliss Extreme, which is moving Arliss towards the Carmen line, and we'll talk about that airframe, and it's targeted really in this range between 100 and 200,000 feet. Arliss S4 takes it smaller, recognizing that uh, we can build satellites much smaller than a CubeSat, and we can think, begin thinking about swarms of smaller satellites rather than just bigger satellites. And the, we can get a lot of value out of the effective interferometry of having a swarm of satellites. And pocket cubes are kind of the exemplar of that size. And so S4 tries to uh, make a paradigm baseline design for pocket cubes. Arliss Light, if you have pocket cubes, you need to think about flying them. And you can fly them on big rockets, as think about rideshare on big commercial rockets, but you can also fly them on very small rockets. So in the same way that we can build a rocket like a, a SA Cup 10K or an Arliss M that flies one satellite of CubeSat size, we now can build smaller airframes, airless light, that essentially fly one or two or three uh, pocket cubes. And lastly, to make the complete range out, we have Arliss Micro, which essentially takes the same electronics and same software in the Arliss satellite, S4 satellites, and shrinks it down to the size of a hen's egg to fly it essentially in tark size eggs. So Arliss Classic. The model here is to build a rocket. You've seen uh, this particular design at the bottom is from 2000. It's one of my first rockets, uh, first L3s. Uh, it looks like, as you might imagine, very much like a uh, TARC rocket. I mean, uh, a, a 10K rocket. The difference for Arliss is that we have a, a community of about 10 to 15 level three flyers that fly and build these reliably. And um, we then take the, our 
our partners with student payloads. Generally, our student payload is roughly the size of a volume of a 3U, but more like the mass of a 1U, though there's a 3U space in these rockets. And we have a known flight acceleration and shock profile. We fly with standard motors. Each airframe is about the same mass. So we deliver about the same ride to every payload. And much of you have seen this. Here comes, you know, 20-year-old 20, 20 slide of uh, we deploy at, deploy at Apogee a few seconds after Apogee, kind of aligning the um, uh, nose cone towards the ground to minimize any fouling of, of uh, recovery materials. We then deploy the student satellite. Uh, the biggest, well, there are a number of competitions. The most important one is the comeback competition, which you can pick your way of coming back. Um, and here's some resources to point out to documentation of uh, past articles that talk more in deeply about Arliss Classic. I want to share with you a video. I hope this works. This is video now 15 years old. This is an Arliss flight. Four, three, two, one. As we saw there, the Arliss flight was the first flight to Standard motor, every, we fly every flight on the same motor, which is an Aero, Aerotech M1419. And the rockets are, they come out relatively lighter. Uh, we tend to learn how to build it with less mass than any, any rockets of this size. So now this little robot came down on a parachute. You can see it next door. One of the key things it's now trying to do is get out of its packaging and not to get fouled and the parachute the harness material. These are all autonomous. They can send telemetry, but they can't receive any commands. This happens to be a Japanese team. So now the um, robot is trying to figure out which way it needs to go, which way is the uh, goal. This one isn't quite as far, but we've had, you know, we're, you're kind of governed by not only by the natural rocket flight, by the wind and weather. Um, so that we've had uh, uh, robots come back from as far as uh, 10 kilometers coming across the playa. So designs about mechanical robustness, efficiency of design to maintain good use of battery power, good navigation. Where the flat Japanese flag is, is the goal. And you can see this guy, this robot, is now just about to find the goal. Yep, making its turn. Oh, oh, oh. It's coming. Hey, hey. Minna Zmare, hola, H. Mazare. Stop. So, um, one of the things you see there is that the, the limits of accuracy in those days, 15 years ago, was roughly the limits of GPS, which is kind of like three meters. And uh, modern day, we can now do sensor fusion and some machine learning to get much better accuracy. So the last year we flew this was sadly two years ago. And the winning team was a woman-led team from Japan that um, they've had a rover much like that except they enhanced it with vision and imaging and machine learning. They threw, they flew their uh, payload three times. The first time they flew it, it only came within about two centimeters of the goal. The second and third time, it actually hit the goal. Uh, it was just an amazing experience of doing sensor fusion, robustness of landing, robustness of recovery, and a truly outstanding piece of engineering. So Arliss satellites over the years, we began with CANSATs, which are the classic uh, soda can size. Moving on to CubeSats, 
Moving on to the most common robot right now is about a cube size mass or a little less. That is not of the same form factor. This one uh, is deployed kind of as a cylinder. Those legs are all spring loaded and they're folded against the body. When the, at deployment, the legs uh, spring out and they have these really, really cleverly designed um, wheels that are essentially these spikes that are perfect for navigating tough terrain. So that's one of my favorite ones. And now we're come down to pocket cubes. The one on the left is a, a five centimeter, one P. The one in the middle is a 1.5 P. And then the one on the left is a two P. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing us building swarms of these rather than just simple big robots. Uh, this is a model of, of uh, my S4 project with uh, foldable antennas. So I've been flying um, basically what people have been flying as um, SA Cup 10K projects uh, for about 20 years. And Arliss M is basically, uh, uh, it deploys up to a 3U CubeSat, and it deploys it roughly at 10K with a 98 millimeter motor mount. Uh, so an Arliss M is essentially the same as a prototype of most SA Cup 10K projects. And my experience is, that's my rocket with one of my teams. Uh, so I've built about four of these and I've flown it about 40 plus times. Collectively as Arliss, as I've said, we've done about 700 plus successful missions. I've lost memory, over 99% mission success. One of the key things that I've learned about and have to keep reminding myself is think about airframe venting, avionics venting, redundant avionics, switches always fail, pick the right switches, uh, know your shear pins and test them. And think about payload deployment following, because in a complex architecture like this, as we are trying to recover the airframe under avionics, one of the hardest things is to make sure your payload doesn't get fouled in your recovery parachutes. It turns out that in flying this, I and as I began to learn more about rocketry and I began to think more about particularly aerodynamics, this design is suboptimal, the classic. Um, and if you go back and think about what I'm really trying to deliver is an RLS is a one, a three U CubeSat deployer to 10K. And if I add the constraint that I'd like it to be efficient, in other words, I'd prefer that it is sub optimized for subsonic drag and it uses the least amount of propellant possible. This was my first attempt, is the pic one picture I have of that. And you can see it's a Frankenstein lower end uh, four inch minimum diameter rocket with an upper stage to do uh, payload deployment. And so the things I began to learn to think about were lower subsonic drag, less mass, le lower cost, smaller motor for the same altitude. And I eventually built one. I don't have the picture of it, sadly, but it looked like this. And uh, it had about 30% lower drag, 30% and mass. And hence, it got about 30% more altitude on the same motor. So when I flew this on an M1419, rather than going to about 10 or 11K, it went to 16K. And I think that we, as we think about doing a complete system design for the complete system, the only way it makes sense through opt, well, the only drag analysis makes sense on the entire airframe is to do it for the mission. And subsonically drag is really all about, just like on a ship in the water, it's all about weighted area. And so von Karman nose cones of high, a large fineness ratios just aren't interesting and aren't appropriate. So thinking about as a system, this is kind of an optimal architecture for a sub, subsonic 3U CubeSat deployer. I would love someone to find a better one. So when you add in efficiency and cost, analysis matters much more. So second project we did was Arla's virtual classroom, essentially saying, you know, we're bringing in all these international teams. We need to have a virtual presence for education, tracking, voice, and internet communication. We built one of these uh, from 2006 to 2016. Uh, we got a donated XTV van from uh, a LA TV station. We added on a, a satellite plus cellular internet. We had local servers, hotspots, uh, UFF, UHF, and VHF voice and data gateways. So we use this actually on many of our things for high-level mission tracking as a ground station. And here's links to resources that tell you more about the details. 
It's now become retired to be a California emergency services. They're using it for emergency uh, deployment in the case of wildfires in California. <coughs> Our curiosity was we want to document the flight stresses on payloads, much like you do on a commercial flight. So we built a custom payload deployer uh, as a variant of our standard payload deployer to measure shock vibration and acceleration. It had a uh, fits in the bottom of a Arliss M payload deployer. And it was led by a team of Bob Ferritich and his team from 2012 to 2017. Uh, great little measurement instrument with a 200G 3D accelerometer, a 2000 degree per second 3D gyro. The most important thing is it had the speed to gather data at 1.3 kilohertz in terms of the sample rate. So we could begin to see real detail in terms of shock and vibration. We got great data um, on flight events, launch acceleration, do the integration to find the power of your motor, but most importantly about deployment shock. So we've been able to calculate the, the typical deployment shock spectrum. One of the conclusions actually came out of this, we did this both for black powder deployment as well as CO2, we found them effectively the same. And there's a conventional wisdom that somehow CO2 is gentler. Uh, we didn't find that in real data. So there's a great set of reports that are online that I urge you to go look at. Then our project was Arliss Extreme, which we started uh, roughly about eight years ago. The goal was to build a low cost reusable amateur sounding rocket that could go closer to 100 to 200K. Um, and we, based on our successful project in 2012, sponsored by John Carmack, uh, which we got to 104,000 feet fully recovered. Uh, this is that rocket. It's now uh, an exhibit in the Seattle Museum of Flight. And if I can make, make a quick comment, my son who just got married yesterday painted that rocket and I'm very proud of that. Um, oh, I should also tell you, the paint job on that is very interesting. We found there was no real temperature effects on the airframe. And the only temperature we saw of the shock wave was on the sustainer, which went at Mach 3.5 at roughly 35,000 feet. And we could see that in the first two thirds of the rocket, there was essentially no effect. And then about two thirds of the way back on the sustainer, we saw the supersonic shock wave came back to the, to the airframe. And we could see a little bit of melting in the paint uh, right about there. So we had a visual, visual piece of concrete evidence about the supersonic shockwave. So it's designed to fly as a standard science mission payload, both captive and deployed. It can fly three 1P payloads or a combination of 2P, 1.5, or three. It carries about 0.3 kilograms, about 250 uh, cubic centimeters. And above 100K, you can do real science uh, because, for example, uh, cosmic rays don't go much below 100K, so we can begin to see even things like gamma ray spectroscopy. Uh, it's a two-stage, four-inch to three-inch airframe, basically all off-the-shelf parts, commercial rocket motors, um, and it's fully recovered reusable. The cost of propellant is about $1,500 a flight. And this is our original document, uh, which we're really proud of in terms of the analysis went into it to figure out the great right plan form by doing drag analysis and simulation, by figuring out how to do nose cone design, fin design, pioneering and doing vacuum bag carbon fiber fins, a uh, whole bunch of things. I urge you to go look at it because I'm really proud of it. So this is a documentary that happened about that flight. I think it's enormously liberating to be able to give individuals the power to investigate their world. Technology always starts as something esoteric and expensive, and then it filters down to the masses. And once the masses get a hold of it, we, we do fun things with it. Today, we're building a two-stage rocket designed to reach 100,000 feet. John Carmack is sponsoring a competition for amateur rocketry enthusiasts to break 100,000 feet and publish the design for the rocket to help advance the state of the art. We built a two-stage rocket. So you start with one stage that burns for a while. You discard all the extra weight, leaving another rocket that fires again, and it flies the rest of the 80% of the flight. Two-stage was the only way we could reach the altitude we wanted, but it's very difficult to get a successful two-stage flight. 
The Black Rock Desert is the best place in the world for this kind of rocketry. We've got the biggest piece of nowhere uh, anywhere on Earth. It's a very challenging environment to launch in. There's wind, there's dust, it's hot. It makes life difficult every way it can. You've got a pretty cool model rocket out there. It's a screaming eagle, it's a little jet fighter. Everyone here is either an engineer or a, a hobbyist who loves getting their hands dirty. Three, two, one, one. For us, this is all a big playground. Previously, getting into space has been governments. Now we're moving to the place where individuals can find a way to get close to space, right? We're doing it ourselves, as opposed to depending on other people doing it. So I think this is a trend of do it yourself. We've got our droid astronaut. He's, uh, he's getting ready for his first flight. We started to see that we could fit a phone in the nose cone of this 100,000 foot design. The phone's got a gyroscope, it's got an accelerometer, it's got a barometer, it's got a GPS. It's got all these sensors that make it sort of like a little miniature satellite that we could conceivably relay that data to a ground station. And that tells us an awful lot about what the rocket was doing in flight. There's only been a handful of amateurs who have gone over 100,000 feet. The highest piece that men have gone to is Everest, which is 29,000 feet. Passenger jet flies roughly about the height of Everest, about 35,000 feet. U-2 spy plane went to 70, 80,000 feet. In order to get to 100,000 feet, we will have to fly roughly at three times the speed of sound, which is Mach 3, roughly about 2,000 miles an hour. That is 50% faster than the fastest military jet aircraft flown by the U.S. today. From 100,000 feet, you can start to see the curvature of the Earth. You can see the black of space. It's amazing that I can build something in my basement that gets to the edge of the Earth's atmosphere. It's the nearest thing to being an astronaut. We're flying tomorrow morning. Success is guaranteed. <laughs> Did I just say that on camera? Wow. <laughs> I think there's nothing more ecstatic and more frightening, actually. It's when something you build is sitting on a launch pad. Butterflies galore in the last few seconds, just before you push the button, because at that point, you're, you don't have any control of it. It's off on its own. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Turns out the rocket was in a hugely rugged country. We would never have found it if I didn't know it was there and if I could look at Google Maps and say that there were actually roads to get there. Here's our guy. <laughs> nothing broken, nothing chipped. He's all good. No, 300,000 feet is the demarcation of space. That's, that's really space. And um, we're not sure if we can get there or not, but we think we can get awfully close. The thrill of this thing compels me to try and go a little better, a little faster, a little higher. <laughs> so let me move on. And um, uh, Project Next is Arliss S4, which is essentially replacing pocket cubes as kind of the new um, a baseline of, of, of STEM payloads. And it's based upon using a 3D printed five centimeter diameter uh, dimension pocket cube package. 
uh, can be deployed either for captive carry inside the rocket or independent recovery. Uh, the nice thing about size is now we can make many of these. So we can think about swarms. So telemetry and radio communications become important. It's based on a high-end uh, 130 megahertz uh, uh, ARM processor. Core software is written in C++, so, uh, but Python is possible, but Python for these stages dramatically reduces the sample rate. It has embedded uh, wireless, LoRa wireless telemetry, both uh, down to the ground station, but also using carrier sense multiple access to be able to share the channel and communicate between uh, satellites in a swarm. You can design a mission with some subset of the uh, sensors to design, measure flight dynamics, air pollution, look down with synthetic, app, synthetic cameras to do plant growth, water coverage, uh, or uh, to, to recover an autonomous robot swarm on virtual Mars by equivalenting each of your little pocket cubes with Regala wings and uh, LoRa telemetry between them. And because the fundamental electronics are commercial, fl most of them will fly in LEO. Some sensors don't make any sense clearly in vacuum. You need to do add the uh, a, a better uh, power system for uh, solar cells. Uh, and I'll leave you with a, a link to the uh, to the description of the system. And this is a system I'm spending a lot of time on and upgrading in terms of getting the latest processor technology and the latest uh, sensor technology. One example of a 1P pocket cube that is not an RLS project is FOSASAT, which was developed by a team of Spanish high school students. It's a 1P pocket cube. It was put into LEO on uh, an Electron in November 2019. I love it because it pioneers using LoRa to LEO, and they succeeded in getting a few packets uh, from their system from down to the ground. But using a $5 uh, radio is really cool. Now, the first pocket cube was a $50 sat in 2013 that was launched on a, a Russian Dnieper. And um, it also used a $5 chip that was an older chip, basically FSK modulation at 300 baud. So um, one of the nice things about these latest LoRa chips is they can also be modulated in FSK or RTTY. So we can have a variety of mission profiles with customized telemetry. So I've built this now uh, to fly small pocket cubes, built an optimized carrier for S4 satellites. It's a minimum design for minimum subsonic drag, lowering the entire wetted area. So it gets the highest altitude on the least cost. It flies S4 satellites built on a fiberglass body tube, uh, commercial Altus Metro avionics, 3D printed parts in PET-G of the nose cone avionics bay, S4 payload itself, flyaway launch lugs, fin cans, recovery anchors, motor retainers, and here's a link to the products, and it flies really nice. Five, four, three, two, one. Um, Arlis Micro is then the smallest, and I think about it as TARC for payloads. And as I was talking to um, uh, uh, our leader of uh, TARC, the idea of now stripping down and doing a payload the size of a hen's egg. So we now can reduce the payload to a basic same processor, same software, same telemetry, core sensors of GPS plus other sensors on the I squared C bus. It's just smaller and it fits in a small space. Um, we're looking to not only use the same software, but build a reduced version of Python that's a little easier to um, modify, even if it's a smaller sample rate. And it's deployable in a little uh, 3D printed airframe off a micro rail uh, to, you know, a thousand feet. And um, so now we can think about missions from a thousand feet with hen's eggs up to orbit. So if you have your payload, you now can choose to fly it a thousand feet in a park. You can fly a bigger one, an S4, a complete pocket cube. Uh, from 1,000 feet to uh, 5,000 feet. You can fly at a swarm of them on a classic Arles rocket, either on a K or an M motor, to uh, 10,000 feet. Or you can fly on an Arles Extreme with 3U worth of, probably 3P worth of payload uh, to about nominally 150,000 feet and $500 per uh, satellite.
Six, or take it to orbit. Five, four, mission three, two, one. There's a lovely company uh, in um, the Netherlands called Ar uh, uh, called um, Albus Orbital, Albus Orbital, that will sell you a ride on one of their pocket cube deployers on Electron or on other payload frames for roughly about 25k a ride for one peak. So come join us at Arlis. We you can build your own rockets and build your own payloads and fly them anytime, any place, from Park to Leo. Or come join us with the competition with the world every September, every year at Aeropac uh, in combination with UNICEF at Black Rock, Nevada. Uh, arguably one of the best places in the world to go fly. It's all possible. And thanking you, thank you for your time today. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll reiter reiterate the, uh, the Black Rock Desert being just a fantastic place to launch. Uh, Really enjoy it out there. Hey, we, we do have a couple of questions uh, that are already queued up, and uh, we have some time to take some more Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the Q&A tab, and we'll get uh, Ken to, to give an answer. So um, actually, this is funny, because I did notice on your uh, the 2012 shot that you showed, I heard Kate. It must have been an early version of Kate. Um, uh, well, we worked. We Kate was too expensive for us, so we didn't fly Kate, and, oh. and so we flew other stuff. But it may have been in the background on somebody else's airframe. Oh, isn't that funny? Because actually, there's another question here that said they have you used the, the newest Kate uh, 3.0 from Volta Drive. Uh, we still like um, Telemegas as our oh, yeah. our prime as our primary avionics with backup of Easy Megas, and we fly. Um, uh, we fly redundant telemetry. So our backup telemetry is a, uh, a big red B beeline at 70 centimeters. Uh, and we use actually a special ground station for our 70 centimeter retrieval that uses some great little satellite uh, 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 helical antennas that are omnidirectional so we don't have to point antennas because we're mm -hmm. failure and people can't do that very well. And uh, uh, so we actually have uh, an antenna system on our ground station that probably goes to orbit. And uh, we use APRS as our primary uh, telemetry system. Yeah, interesting. Okay, we, got a, we do have a, uh, a question here. Um, do you think that the uh, 1.3 kilohertz sampling rate captures enough of the important vibration spectrum? Um, I think we were satisfied. I would ask you to go read the reports we did on that telemetry. Uh, it's so much better than any anybody else has done for amateur payloads. We felt the quality was similar to the shock spectrum that we were getting for commercial specs. Um, and um, so for what our purpose was, which was to characterize the flight profile of a payload on one of these rockets, we solved the problem. Now, is more data good? Absolutely. I'd love to see <laughs> yeah. the data and compare it to our data and, and, and see if there's a material difference. But, um, and also, I'm not a good enough mathematician. I'd have to go bring our guys in to go talk about it. But we were very happy with that. Yeah, he, he did say that, you know, for the, the 5 and 10K shots, would it be worth that effort to uh, increase? The well, no, I think he was suggesting, as I read the question here, Go from 1.3 kilohertz to 5 kilohertz or 10 kilohertz. That's oh, how oh, yeah. Okay, yep, 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 yep. yep. And uh, which increases the sampling rate, which lets you do a, a, a better analysis. Um, there's also a fair amount of noise in this. So I don't, I'm not necessarily, I, I would be, I'm happy with what we did. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> hey, uh, the, uh... Next question is uh, about uh, analog sensors. Can they be uh, affected by environmental conditions very quickly? But most CubeSats use analog sensors. Is it better to use digital sensors? And what do you think? Um, I think it depends on your mission. But I think right now, looking at the complete sensor portfolio, there's such real great work being done on smart sensors. 
that are not only with digital sensors, but with smart electronics to do pre-processing on the sensor chip. And then you then connect it with essentially a very good bus, either SPI or I squared C. So I think the flexibility of a digital sensor system with a common bus architecture, I have, I think I squared C is great. Um, I, the big complaint I have about I squared C is you don't have enough, you become IO limited rather than processor limited. And so one of the great things, there's a new version of the Raspberry Pi for uh, built as a, sens as a sensor platform, the 2040, that is actually a dual processor, uh, which actually can have multiple buses. So it, you can help on the IO limited piece. The other piece I've discovered is that uh, in programming this, Sensors go at a wide variety of sample rates, running from once a second down to one, a few milliseconds, particularly for IMU class sensors. So you really need to uh, have a system that is very clever about this. I use now, I've moved to a multitasking operating system that is interrupt based so that I can adapt the sample rate of every sensor to be as fast as possible for that sensor rather than doing polling. So it's simple to do a polling loop, but I think it's not very good in terms of the quality of data you get. So this all goes to my previous 3D printing thing. This is a 3D, this is a software driven space, making great, <laughs> great avionics, designing stuff by software, you know, spoken as a software guy, but you know, that's me. <laughs> well, anybody else have any questions for Ken? Uh, great opportunity, great program. Uh, Actually, let me ask at one more point. What I've discovered is the sensor rate is so high with so many sensors, I don't have enough processors and I don't have enough bandwidth. So now I'm moving to multi-processor designs using uh, a message passing architecture to try to get faster overall sensor bandwidth. And um, we're finding great new, uh, so for example, in the S4, you can see that it's a stacked set of boards, each of which is about 40 millimeters on a side. Uh, there's a common bus, which is I squared, there's two I squared C buses. One of them is a fast bus running at about two megahertz. And one is a slow bus running at a conventional I squared C space, about 400 kilohertz. And I now have smart processors on different sensor boards to do local pre-processing. So for imaging, for collecting uh, radio, uh, uh, radioactive spectrometer data. So I do pre-processing there to essentially have a shorter bus that processes it faster. I'm having way too much fun, actually. <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking, and, and, and yeah, three, you, you, uh, it seems like you spent a fair amount of time thinking about this as well as your 3D printing. So. You know, um, oh, good. Uh, data logging. Um, one of the problems with SD cards uh, is that they come loose on shock. Hmm. And the last thing you want to do is have your, in the middle of your flight, your SD card come loose and you lose all your data. So... I'm moving to a uh, flash memory that is hardwired. Um, uh, I found a wonderful new, uh, for those of you that use Adafruit, Adafruit has a wonderful new little 512 megabyte, uh, it uses the same electronics as an SD card, but hardwired. So there's no spring loaded little card. Uh, and it's gonna be far more robust to flight, flight dynamics. All right. Uh, anybody else out there? Okay, well, thank you guys. And if anybody wants to come fly, fly Arliss in addition to SA Cup, come join us. You know, if you've got a great robot that you think can uh, uh, do the combination of machine learning with imaging and GPS and other sensors that can hit the flag, come show us. All right, thank you very much, Steve. And uh, thank you for the audience and questions. And thank you. All right, Ken. Bye-bye.